Welcome to the Capital News. I am your host, Alex Caritas. Today is Tuesday, September 15th, 2020. Thank you so much for joining me. The title of today's podcast is Town Hall Showdown this week. Uh, there's a couple town halls. Actually, there was one this evening with President Trump on ABC News, hosted by George Stephanopoulos. On Thursday evening, Joe Biden will be having a town hall on CNN with host Anderson Cooper, and I believe that one will be out of Scranton, PA. President Trump's was out of Philadelphia this evening, so we're going to talk about that. This is sort of a inside look, a little preview as to what the first debate might look like, what it might sound like, some of the questions that Chris Wallace, the moderator, might be asking. So I think it's important to have a brief discussion. I'm not going to go into great detail. I watched some of it uh, this evening with the president, um, but I'm going to provide a little bit of analysis on what he did say, how he did, and then preview what it's likely going to look like on Thursday with Joe Biden as well. Um, But again, as I've been telling the audience, I'm reserving my analysis that I'm going to share with the audience uh, until, with, with respect to the Electoral College, until the first debate is in the books, because I think that's going to be crucial. I think that's going to solidify uh, in a lot of people's minds uh, who they're voting for. I think a lot of the country already knows who they're going to vote for. If there are people on the fence, uh, this first debate is pretty much most likely going to carry the most weight out of all the debates. And again, with early voting, mail-in voting, what have you, uh, if people say, I cannot, I really don't want to vote for Donald Trump, but I need to see Joe Biden perform. He he can't live up to this caricature that Donald Trump is putting out there and, you know, that they're all demented. They're all demented, okay? But you understand what I'm saying. So as long as Joe Biden can hold his own, then that might be enough for people to say, okay, I can vote for Joe Biden. I'm going to mail it in or I'm going to vote early, do what I want to do, and then that's it. And again, if Joe Biden should crap the bed in debate number two and debate number three, eh, it's too late for some of these things. So the, the first debate's going to be important. And that's why I am reserving my analysis on the Electoral College until the conclusion of that first debate. Uh, Market performance, obviously, we're going to discuss. A couple more statements out of Bob Woodward's book. Um, Sneak preview. And really just a couple questions I I want to ask that I've been asking because tomorrow is going to be the conclusion of the Federal Open Market Committee with the Federal Reserve. So Chairman Jay Powell is going to come out and give his press conference. He's going to make his statement and then take questions from the financial media. Of course, this is a dog and pony show. They never ask any major serious questions. So I I really just have a couple that I want them to ask. And these are questions that you have heard before. But I also want this same question asked to the president of the United States. I would also like Joe Biden to answer it but particularly Jay Powell because he is a man in charge and the president because he is a man in charge. But Joe Biden might be the next president, so he should answer this question as well. And it's very simple, and we'll get to that. So we'll talk about that. But then, of course, some of the bigger news today, and this is something that you want to, I I think, commend the president and his team for doing. You had the uh, peace signing ceremony today at the White House between Israel, Bahrain, UAE, and the United States. I always want to give the president credit where credit is due. I have always given this president credit when he's attempted or has reached across the aisle or reached across the ocean to have discussions and to have meetings with people that uh, a lot of the establishment says, oh, no, you can't meet them, you can't dignify them with having a meeting. No, no. You have to sit down with people you disagree with. It's easy to sit down with your friends and allies and your partners. Leadership is about doing the difficult tasks. That's what it's about. It's not what's doing what's easy. It's doing what's hard, what's difficult. And it doesn't mean that the president, in doing so, gives up the palace. He gives away the keys to the city. It's a meeting. Try to form a relationship. Try to have some type of meaningful conversation that can move things, hopefully, in the right direction. Now, maybe you'll succeed, maybe you won't, but you're trying. And I've always given the president credit for that, especially with uh, North Korea. I also give the president a lot of credit for not taking us down the path 
or at least not in, another hot war. Because there have been several opportunities throughout his administration thus far where he easily could have put troops on the ground. He could have went into Venezuela. He could have went into Iran. Now, we're meddling in both of those countries and elsewhere, but at least it has not escalated, at least not to this point, into a boots-on-the-ground all-out war. So again, I give him credit for that. Now, we know from Bob Woodward's book that a hot war with North Korea was, we were pretty damn close. We were pretty close. So again, congratulate the president and his administration for these peace deals in the Middle East thus far, claiming that there are going to be further to come. I hope that's the case. I hope these are serious. We'll have to do a little bit more of a deep dive into uh, the details and the terms of these deals. I am a skeptical and cynical person by nature. I am not an investigative journalist, but I think that's one of the hallmark aspects of any good investigative journalist is to be skeptical and is to be cynical. And of course, we wrote the book, The Cynic's Guide to Investing. So I I can't help, despite the fact that this is good news, I, I can't help myself to ask the question with the timing of all of this, because all of a sudden, a couple months away from an election, and we have these type of peace agreements. I hope they're long lasting. I hope they're significant, and I hope they're serious. But time will, of course, prove this out because we do know that some of the countries that are a party to this uh, are also receiving uh, some military hardware from the United States. So isn't that great? We got peace, but we got to give you weapons and airplanes and all that jazz. It's always something, isn't it? I cannot recall the name, but I do believe it was a Roman general who said, if you want peace, prepare for war. So I guess they're following that mantra a little bit. But we will continue to keep you updated on any other agreements, who else comes to the table. Uh, And uh, again, we're going to question the timing of it, but it's in the right direction and we'll give the president and his administration credit for the time being. That's a good thing. We want peace. We want prosperity. Market performance, we have the dollar index once again with a 93 handle. It did fall below uh, 93 yesterday, as we mentioned. It is back above 93 slightly on the dollar index. 93 spot 04 is where the dollar index is trading. Stock market across the board did uh, did pretty well today. Again, up, 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 especially the NASDAQ and the tech sector leading the way, although off of the day's highs. Overnight futures, we have the Dow Jones Industrial Average trading up about three-tenths of 1%. The S&P 500 is up about four-tenths of 1%. And the NASDAQ 100 is trading up about one-half of 1%. Cash trade in Japan, relatively flat, but up one-tenth of 1%. Across the pond, a sea of green, depending on the index, anywhere from about two-tenths of 1% all the way up to 1.3% in the UK markets, that being the FTSE 100. We have the cash trade in Australia trading up 1% at the time of the podcast. On the share front, we have Apple up slightly. They announced today, you know, some new products, uh, announcing, I think, another iPhone coming out, another model, a couple watches coming out, this, that, and the other. And I and I guess, uh, because I think Apple was up maybe as much as 3% intraday, and it, it, is, it, it closed up, what, 19 cents here I'm looking at. So why the reversal? Well, maybe because the markets are wising up to the fact that, I mean, how much better are you going to make a cell phone at this point? How many more cameras are you going to add to it? Oh, well, honey, we had to add a fourth camera. We got a fourth camera. How did we make it this far without having a third or fourth camera on our phones? I don't know. This is not innovation, ladies and gentlemen. It just just isn't. Uh, The watch. Oh, I mean, God forbid. I mean, what? A sundial? I mean, how magnificent is this thing? Okay, you made a watch. I think one of the price points for one of the watches is $399. That's perfectly fine. Whatever the market bears, that's fine. But I think Apple also announced some sort of financing option for the watch. Let me give you a little tidbit of financial wisdom. Now, you do this what you want. If you need to take out financing to purchase a watch that costs $399, you listening? You can't afford it. 
That simple. Now, you're going to do what you want to do, but I'm just telling you, if you need to take out financing to buy a, a watch that's $399, you can't afford it. You shouldn't buy it. But do what you want. You're going to anyway. Tesla is up another 30 points for the day, up 7%. It's almost like the sell-off never happened. I mean, it could be north of 500 tomorrow if it rallies once again. Microsoft gaining 1.6%, Amazon up 1.7%, Alphabet, the parent company of Google, up 1.7% as well, and Facebook gaining about two and a third percentage points. Now we'll see what happens with Facebook. There was some news that took place later in the day. Uh, Kim Kardashian West is going to freeze her Facebook and Instagram accounts, and of course Instagram is owned by Facebook for a day. Oh, in protest. Oh, wow, a day. Okay, we're not going to see her fat ass on uh, social media for a day. And, you know, this might move the stock market. Uh, so that tells you how solid our stock market is when the Kardashians, by doing something, could move the markets. That's how rock solid our markets are. So that just tells you a little bit more of the hysteria and the hyper bubble that we are in. So we'll see what happens with Facebook. I also believe that uh, some government agencies are looking in to Facebook and might actually be taking action against them, but we've heard this song and dance before, so we'll see if that comes to fruition. On the commodity front, we have WTI trading at $39 a barrel. Brent is at $41.24, so gaining a back above that $40 threshold that we, we've been looking at. We have natural gas trading at $2.36. And now, of course, we have another hurricane, unfortunately, in the Gulf Coast, Hurricane Sally. Uh, it doesn't appear to be destructive from the standpoint of wind damage, although there's going to be some, I imagine, but more so from flooding. This is a very slow-moving hurricane, big storm, lots of rain, and I would imagine that most damage uh, that takes place when you have these hurricanes, the, the majority of the damage done is as a result of the flooding, where the most severe damage is done by flooding, because that's basically a total loss. So, Seek shelter if you need to, uh, and let's hope for the best down south in the Gulf. Gold and silver, an okay day. Uh, we have gold trading. So this is gold spot price at $1,960 an ounce, slightly up. And we have silver also slightly up, trading at $27.28 an ounce. Rounding it out, we have Uncle Sam's 10-year Treasury junk note yielding 0.67%, and it has been range-bound for a while. So that's some of the market performance. Let's go to the Federal Reserve. Like I said, Jay Powell, Chairman of the Federal Reserve, will be out tomorrow. Press conference statement about what the Federal Reserve is, is doing. They're going to keep rates low. He's not even thinking about thinking about thinking about raising rates. But then they might also tell us that somehow they're data dependent. Uh, it, 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 these guys have no credibility at all. It is completely gone. It's completely gone, but nobody's going to press them on it. And even if they did, Jay Powell would dance around it, and they wouldn't press them on it. Just be that would be it. And I imagine, I don't know for certain, but I imagine this will be another virtual press conference, but I could be wrong. It might be in person this time, but it's, it's probably still all, all online. So it's not even like they can start to really interrupt because somebody's probably got control of a button somewhere. They can mute somebody's mic. So even if they were trying to get tough with them, they just blank screen, can't talk anymore. All I want to ask in all of this, because again, twenty-seven, almost a $27 trillion national debt. An actual budget deficit of $4.2 trillion which means we are spending $7.3 trillion this year alone. That's just at the federal level. When you take into consideration federal, state, and local spending, we are at $9.5, almost $9.6 trillion. We have a GDP of about $19.5 trillion. So you do the math. Now, the president claims that this will never be a socialist country so long as he's the president. Well, it's too late, sir, but I would like his definition of what that means. $9.5 trillion. In government spending, federal, state, and local, most of it at the federal level, we got a GDP at 19 and a half. You do the math. You tell me how this is not a socialist country. Okay? We're already there. We've been there. But here's the question. With all of this spending, why don't you give everybody a million dollars? Why don't you print 
a million dollars for everybody and make everybody an instant millionaire. Because according to you guys, there's no negative consequences, no negative side effects to this. Clearly, debts and deficits don't matter to you. This is not the time to worry about it. You weren't worried about it. You weren't even dealing with them in an environment that you claimed was Boomtown USA, which would be an environment that would afford you the ability to start tackling debts and deficits. You do it during the good times. You didn't even do it then. In fact, we added another trillion dollars to the national debt in 2019, before COVID-19. So why don't you give everybody a million dollars? And then ask them, what are the limits to this? Isn't this the free lunch? Didn't you discover it? Didn't you create it? Yesterday's podcast, Economic Survey, says, we looked at that NPR survey in conjunction with another foundation, I can't remember off the top of my head, and Harvard University. Okay. Heartbreaking data point after the next. Half the country's broke. If they had savings before COVID-19, it's now depleted. And of course, if they didn't have savings, well, they definitely don't have them now. How much more debt did they have to take on as a result of this? Okay, so that's the question. You can, you can help all these people. You can make them all instant millionaires with the Banana Republic printing press, which you say has no negative side effects. You say you're trying to use monetary policy to help with the income inequality that exists in this country. We'll make everybody a millionaire. Problem solved. See how smart we are here? Why don't you do that then? What are the limits? Because you're making it seem like there aren't any. And I'm being serious. Ask that question. See how they respond to it. Is a million too rich? 500,000? Quarter million? 100,000? That would be life-changing money to a lot of people who are broke. Half the country. Oh no, but we can print trillions of dollars to flush it into the bond market, to flush it into the corporate debt market, to flush it into the stock market, where 90% of financial assets are owned by the top 10%. And of course, that concentration gets even more concentrated when you go up to the top 1% and top 1% of 1%. So you got about 50% of the country that's broke. They have no stocks. You got about 50% of the country that do have some sort of stock or some sort of financial asset ownership, but the vast majority is owned by the upper echelons. And I'm not trying to be about class warfare. That's not what I'm about, but I'm just telling you where the money's going. Follow the money. That's a crucial rule. Cynic's Guide to Investing. It is one of our rules. It should be one of the rules, and I know it is, of investigative journalists. Follow the money. Ask who benefits. Another rule of the cynical investor. See how this works? That's why when we were focused on economic survey says yesterday, and you had some of the directors of that survey, as quoted in the NPR article, saying this is much, much worse than we anticipated. We thought with all of the Nobody Cares Act, that's of course what I call it, Nobody Cares Act money, it wouldn't be this bad. Well, you're not paying attention to where the money's going. Follow the money. Who benefits? Look at the stock market. Look at these outrageous valuations. This didn't just happen. This happened for a reason. This is the club. This is where the money goes. This is where the power goes. It's a big circle. It's a big cycle. And it's this system, as I stated yesterday, especially in the write-up to economic survey says, this system is eating itself alive. Excessive regulations, excessive taxation, excessive inflation, money printing, economic decline, social decline, political decline, it's all connected. The system is eating itself alive. And we have presidential candidates who don't even mention this stuff. 
a little tidbit here, a little tidbit there. Let's let's keep the people distracted. Let's keep them divided. Let's br- let's blame the Republicans only. Let's blame the Democrats only. Let's scare the hell out of our constituents into voting against the other guy and not force something. Let's not rise to the occasion to unite the country. Let's further divide them. I want to be president of the country, but I'm going to say, screw half the country. That part's the enemy. And if they're in the White House, your towns are going to burn. That's not how you rise above this. That's not how you're going to bring those people and their representatives to the table to get things done. So just ask them, the Federal Reserve, can't you just give everybody a million dollars? Ask Donald Trump the same question. Ask Joe Biden the same question. I would love to hear their answers. Would love it. Would love it. Because again, of course, in President Trump's town hall this evening, again on ABC News, out of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, he had to make mention of the stock market. He cannot help himself. Stock market's up. That must mean the economy's coming back. Well, I take, I would suggest, Mr. President, you take a look at that survey from NPR. I suggest you take a look at your Department of Labor's own statistics that said last week we got about 30 million Americans claiming some form of unemployment insurance benefit. It was 30 million. When you take that against the working population of about 160, 161 million people, you come up to an unemployment rate of 18%, not 84 Eighteen percent, And that doesn't even take into consideration a lot of people who are completely off, off, the, off the reservation, if you will, off the rules, off the data rules. They're not even counted. They've just given up. They're done, basically. So the numbers, unfortunately, are even worse. No question on that. No pushback on that. They never get pushed back on that. He can come up and he say, well, the stock market's going up, isn't it? Yes, because of the Banana Republic printing press. Not because of economic growth. Half the country is broke. Half the country's broke. Can't you just push back? Couldn't, couldn't George Stephanopoulos, don't these people know? And I don't know if they, they actually don't know about what's going on with the Federal Reserve and all this money printing, or if they do know and they're afraid to bring it up because the Federal Reserve somehow is the third rail. You're not supposed to touch that. You're not supposed to enlighten or educate or inform the public that the Federal Reserve exists. And sort of hint, hint, wink, wink, discuss what they might be doing. So I don't know. But I know that none of them ever bring it because it would be so simple. The stock market's up. It's making new records, George. Well, yes, Mr. President, but it's not because of economic growth. Half the country's broke. Here's all these data points. Boom, 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 boom. That we rattle off here all the time and just did. Here's all the money printing. Here's where it went. Boom, 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 boom. How do you explain this? Is that good? And if it's fine, then why not give everybody a million dollars? See how this is all connected? Ask these questions. But George doesn't ask the question, doesn't know to, or is afraid to. Either is unacceptable because this is part of the structural issue here at large that needs to be addressed, and it's never addressed. That's why you, when you listen to these people in these town hall meetings, you can feel their frustration in their voice, whether they supported the president before currently, or they don't. You can feel and sense their frustration. And that's because these individuals, just like everybody else in this country, have been given the same line of BS every election cycle because these two parties don't give a damn about you. They tell you what you want to hear. They put on a performance. They put on a dog and pony show. They put on a circus which they did a couple weeks ago in their respective conventions. They made you cry. They made you laugh. They made you feel patriotic, optimistic. It's exactly how they wanted you to feel. 
But they don't talk about the structural issues, which I said they wouldn't. And they didn't. Because they want power, they want control, they want divide and conquer. And that's how easy it is to do. Put on a show, tell the people what they want to hear, and that's all you need. Now, I will say, in this town hall, President Trump held his own. So we'll see how Joe Biden does on Thursday with Anderson Cooper and CNN. But Trump held his own. Uh, a, a lot of misinformation, uh, a lot of exaggeration, uh, a lot of untruths, and a lot of, I'm going to say lies, because I imagine that the president has to know some of this stuff isn't true, but he says it anyway. So if you know the truth, but you don't say it, then that's a lie. Otherwise, it's just massive incompetence. And in, in, so pick your, pick your poison. Massive incompetence or a liar. Okay, neither is good. And this sort of goes to Bob Woodward's book, At the End where this is the first time he claims that he has done this, where he has provided really an opinion of the president. And he's written on, on, what, nine presidents. He wrote at the end of his book that President Trump is not the man for the hour. And of course, I happen to agree with that. Now, Woodward makes his argument based off of all of the interviews he's had. And this is the second book he's written on, on President Trump. The first one, uh, President Trump really didn't do any interviews uh, with Mr. Woodward, but now maybe because he didn't do it the first time, didn't like how the book came out. Okay, let me talk to him. Let me try to persuade him. Ba 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 ba. Didn't do so. But Bob Woodward is basically saying I've interviewed too many people uh, within this administration who have the president's ear, who are close to him. I have their diaries. I have their journals. I have them on tape. I have them on record. Uh, these are people who served in uniform, who have been in public service, who were cabinet members, close aides, everybody who gave Woodward uh, a window into President Trump's psyche, how he handles situations, how he thinks, what he knows, what he doesn't know, what he thinks he knows but doesn't know, blah, 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 blah. And then, of course, he had several hours worth of conversations with the president himself, gaining further insights into how the president operates. And his conclusion was President Trump is not the man for the hour, which, again, I agree with. But this is, again, a, a sign of a country and a system in decline that the best two candidates, supposedly, that we can come up with is President Trump and Joe Biden. Now, again, I, I implore, I ask this audience to conduct a peaceful revolution. And, and a very easy step is to leave the two-party system and to register as an independent, unaffiliated. I would advocate for the Libertarian Party. And I would advocate that you vote for the Libertarian candidate. She is on, Joe Jorgensen, she is on every ballot in the country. 50 states in Washington, D.C. Now, because she has achieved that feat of being on every ballot, she should be in the debates. And I can assure you, if people heard the message of the Libertarian Party, people would vote for it. It has to be given a platform. It has to be given a chance to breathe. And it isn't because the two-party system doesn't want it. This is a Coke and Pepsi country. That's it. And that, you know, you can't taste root beer. You can't taste 7-Up or Sprite. Can't do it. You got Coke, you got Pepsi, that's it. And then, of course, you recall all of those blind taste tests. Oh, I'm a Coke guy. Oh, I'm a Pepsi guy. Put on the mask, whatever. Pour the, pour the soda in the cup. You drink it. I'm a Coke guy. Well, you know, which one you like better? That one. Well, that's Pepsi. And then the same thing with the Pepsi guy. See? It's just because your guy says it. Same thing with these politicians. The Democrats and the Republicans. A Democrat can say something one year, Republicans go ballistic. But their guy says it, oh, it's perfectly fine. Nothing wrong with it. And same thing for the Democrats. But you know it would be something different. You know if you had that taste test, you would know if you're drinking root beer. You would know for certain if you were drinking 7-Up. It's a different taste. People deserve more options. They deserve to at least hear them. And do you think it's a coincidence that you can't even hear them? I mean, you can go seek them out, obviously. You can go read books with different opinions, different viewpoints. 
But they don't even really have much of a fighting chance. And that's a true shame. And we were forewarned about this by George Washington, of course. Do not separate, do not divide yourselves, do not break off into political parties. It's very simple to know what was going to happen. This is it. This is tribalism. This is team sport. Well, you can't talk bad about my guy. It's my guy. Doesn't matter what he does, says, doesn't matter. Democrat, Republican, if that's who you support, that's it. It was a sickening display to watch MSNBC during the Obama years. It's a sickening display to watch Fox now under the Trump years, especially with respect, and I mean this from the opinion, the commentators. The hard news is the hard news for the most part. I don't have a problem with that. But when it comes to the, and I don't know who makes me uh, more nauseous, to be perfectly honest with you. So it's not a contest either side would want to win. But that's all you need to know. That's why you need to change the channel. That's why you need to listen to all of these stations to at least understand what's being said. Because I can guarantee you that if you're just watching MSNBC or if you're just watching Fox, especially the opinion and the commentators late at night, you're missing a lot of information. A lot of information. But it's probably the information you want to hear. Which, of course, is part of the problem which we were describing at length with our Sunday podcast, The Social Disorder. And that's only going to get worse, especially if everybody just keeps going to listen to what they want to listen to. And right now, I mean, the, the president is feeding into this, which is not good. It's not leadership. Joe Biden isn't helping any either. They, they, they have not earned my vote. They have not earned my respect, and they're not going to get it. You vote for who you want to vote for, but I'm voting for the libertarian candidate. I am trying to send a message to the two-party system that I don't support it. And I'm trying to send a message to the libertarian party that there is support for you. Keep going. So, that's it. Donald Trump held his own. No surprise. And again, he can win. Make no mistake about it. He can become the president of the United States again. He can win re-election. Despite his misinformation, disinformation, lies, myths, untruths, whatever you want to call them, he can still win because he has a way of talking that can convince people because he brings them into a narrative and he tells a story and he hits nerves, frustrations, sensitive nerve endings that, that trigger people. And I picked up on that in 2015, 2016, and, and I, you know, I said this guy's going to win. And I voted for him. I gave him a chance because there was no way in hell I was voting for the horror show of Hillary Clinton. Well, I wasn't doing it. So I said, okay, I'll give this guy a shot. And I thought maybe he could pull it off. I'm not seeing it. Because a lot of what I supported him on was, again, the attacking of the Federal Reserve and going at those structural issues. Now he, he, he praises them. He wants the money printing. He wants negative interest rates. It's completely destructive. We know this. We'll talk about that more, of course, tomorrow with the conclusion of the FOMC meeting. Thursday, we'll do our typical data dump, initial claims, Federal Reserve balance sheet, what have you, money stock. And then, of course, uh, Joe Biden should have his town hall. We'll provide some commentary on that. So a little bit of a window as to what to expect. But Donald Trump, for the most part, held his own this evening. We'll see if Joe Biden does the same on Thursday. Catch you here tomorrow. Stay diversified, stay vigilant, and stay with the Capitol News. I am Alex Caritas. Godspeed.